Velkommen til Under Kalotten. En podcast, som tager afsæt i relationen til Israel. I dette afsnit skal vi høre om næste udviklingstrin i Israels forsvarssystem til beskyttelse mod raketangreb fra fjendtligsindede. Vi tager endnu en gang til Haifa for at besøge Haifa Home og tale med leder Judith Sets. Denne gang for at høre hendes personlige historie om at rejse fra Holland til Israel for at arbejde med holocaust Israels premierminister Bennett siger, at Israels effektive laserforsvar vil gøre fjenden bankerot. I en første af sin slags har Israel med succes testet et nyt lasermissils forsvarssystem, Iron Beam, der kan opsnappe forskellige slags flyvende objekter, alt fra missiler, panservandsraketter til droner. Det nye lasersystem vil ikke kun opfange alle trusler i luftrummet, men også gøre fjenden bankerot, siger den israelske premierminister Naftali Bennett i starten af juni. Bennets udtalelser kommer under et besøg hos Rafael Advanced Weapon Systems, en fabrik, der fremstiller den banebrydende teknologi. Premierministeren besigtede det nyudviklede system, der kan skyde alt fra missiler til ubemandede droner ned med laser, og sagde, det er banebrydende, ikke kun fordi vi kan ramme fjenden med militære midler, men vi kan også gøre den økonomisk bankerort. Det nye lasersystem, Iron Beam, er verdens første energibaserede våbensystem, der bruger en laser til at nedskyde indkommende pilotløse luftfartøjer, raketter, moterer til en pris på ca. 3,5 dollars per skud. I det nuværende missilforsvarssystem Iron Dome er det dyr, der skyder eneste angribende missil ned. Under gasekrigen i forsommeren 2021 affyrede palæstinensiske terrorgrupper 4.500 raketter mod civile israelere i løbet af 11 dage. Det kostede Israel omkring 100.000 dollars for hver forsvarsraket, som skulle bruges til at nedskyde missilerne med, hvilket gjorde den korte krig meget dyr. Når det nye laserforsvarssystem først er opstillet, vil det ifølge Bennett kun kræve nogle få dollars i elektricitet at stoppe et angreb, mens fjenden må investere 10.000 vis af dollars for hver angrebsraket. Testene viser, at forsvarssystemet er det mest omkostningslette og effektive forsvarssystem, der er udviklet i Israel til dato. Lasersystemet vil supplere Iron Dome, der er designet til at opfange kortrækkende missiler i op til 4 km højde. Arrow 2 og Arrow 3, som opfanger raketter uden for jordens atmosfære, og Davids slynge, som er designet til at opfange mellem- og langtrækkende missiler på en afstand på op til 300 km. Denne form for beskyttelse i flere lag skaber samlet set en effektiv paraply mod fjendtlige angreb. Det nyudviklede laserforsvarssystem vil altså supplere det eksisterende forsvarssystem, og medfører en enorm omkostningsbesparelse, samt reducerer modstanders chance for at dræbe civile væsentligt. Dette skriver ikaj.no. I sidste afsnit besøgte vi Haifa Home i Haifa i det nordlige Israel og talte med lederen Judith Sets. I dag skal vi høre hende fortælle hendes personlige historie fra hvordan hendes bedsteforældre redde jøder under krigen, til at hun i dag hjælper selv samme jøder på et plejehjem. I arrived in Israel on the 7th of October 1984. It's the former century actually. I had a love for Israel, absolutely, from God's word, and also because I grew up with actually an aunt that wasn't my aunt, but she was a Jewish girl that was hidden by my grandparents, and she was the only one that survived after of her whole family after the war, and she was the best friend of my mom, and so she was my aunt that wasn't my aunt. And so I, I had a love for Israel, but I think I had a greater love probably for the God of Israel, and when I really became a believer I because I grew up in a Christian home but I came to the conclusion already as teenager it's not because you know my parents take me to church I go to church it's something I need to make a decision for and I I was very simple I'm a farmer's daughter from the north of Holland and I thought you know if I believe that God is my creator you know and he's made me different and 
everyone else because everyone else is different. So he must have a special purpose for my life. And I tried to find out in whatever I knew then how God can lead you, Lord, what is your purpose with my life? And uh, I became a social worker because I felt that's what he wants me to do and I had a great love for people. And then after that, I um, ended up for different reasons in Youth as a Mission. Don't know if you know why when. Why when took me to many places in the world, lived in different places. And one of the places I lived in when I was actually in the school staff was in Lebanon in the 80s. And it was still in the middle of the huge civil war in going on in Lebanon. And also at that time, actually, uh, Israel invaded Lebanon, which I was in Beirut then, with was leading a team of about uh, 28 people and from all over the world. So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I was there for half a year in the middle of a war situation. And there I knew that God called me for the Middle East. And they had asked me, the team that worked in Lebanon, if I wanted to, to pray about coming back and just work with them and their team. I went back to Holland, did uh, different things, and Israel, uh, no, uh, Lebanon was so much on my heart, but I wanted to know, Lord, is this really you? Because I want, I want only to do what you want me to do. And when I was doing uh, a counseling school, because, you know, I'm a social worker and people person, did a, a counseling school in, uh, in Switzerland, then God, all of a sudden, when I was seeking him, started to talk to me about Israel. And... It came as such a huge surprise. I said, why Israel? Okay, to visit. I want to, I love to visit. I had some Israeli friends and I had no clue what I should do there, but I knew. I just knew that I knew that I knew, even though it sounded very weird in my own ears, that I needed to go. I bought an open ticket. You could do that at that time. I had a backpack and I thought, you know, maybe God wants me to show Israel first before he calls me to Lebanon. Anyway, what happened in the end, that in an amazing way, that God just brought me to the embassy. They were looking for someone, and they had different people that they had interviewed, and they all felt that I'm the person for the job. So I started to work there exactly yesterday, 37 years ago. I took it a year at a time, not dreaming about it. I would still be here after so many years. <laughs> And then God did another amazing thing because I came as a single with my backpack and then God gave me even a husband. I met my husband here, but the funny thing is that he was born only 40 kilometers from where I was born in the north of Holland. <laughs> He's as Dutch as I am, as non-Jewish as I am. And we met in Jerusalem. We just knew that we knew that God had a plan with our lives. So we got married in 87 and started to work both of us at the embassy as well as an anthropologist and also he uh, he studied arabic and he and we started to really build up the work that was very small then of the a department but then we and it was a completely different land completely different population very anti-Christian, you know, so that's what, what uh, I've been doing all these years. Uh, the Lord gave us two beautiful boys. So they both grew up here. They served in the Israeli army. And through the, all the years, in all the intifadas, in the wars, the Gulf War, the, the, our boys in the army and losing, you know, friends there in, uh, in the fighting, you know, he gave me such... Uh, he made me so one with these people. <laughs> Don't know why that touches me so much, but but that's that's a process I've been going through. And at the end of my career here, then he brings me to Haifa, and I feel it's like the circle is coming round. How could I ever have dreamed growing up with this aunt, this little Jewish girl, I was the only one who uh, who survived. Then that at the end of my life, God just calls me to live with these people and to, you know, to give them what I said already. I'm such a people person. And all the years in the embassy, I've been traveling. I've been to every corner of Israel. I worked with ultra-Orthodox, the, the secular Jewish people, Druze, everything here, because that's what we do at the embassy. And then he brings me to this group, which is... 
it's so amazing that that we are able to to just love them and people that have not like a lot of Israelis they you know they still have such a distorted idea of what Christianity is they know it from the past they know it from the pogroms they know it from Christian Europe where uh, where all this happened uh, during the Holocaust and and to be able to be here with a team and to carry his presence in their rooms and to love them and I always say you know that is the the biggest thing that God calls us for so many people want to want to bring Bibles I understand all of that but we need to show the love that God has for them. And we don't have it ourselves, I can tell you. Because not all of these people that are so traumatized are very lovable. But, you know, He wants us to just love on them. And like Yeshua, who, when He was here on earth, you know, if you see His life, He, he was so busy always in crowds all over the place. But He had always an eye for that little lady in, in this huge crowd. And I think that's what God calls us to do. And then we have an amazing Israeli staff, which is, and that's for me, an other circle that comes around. We have an Ethiopian uh, lady who came, made Aliyah in the 90s. We have uh, a Druze social worker, you know, who's from the Druze community. We have a religious uh, Jew who, uh, who is a manager here. We have Muslims. We even have a, a, a Muslim guy who was in prison 27 years. He came out not long ago and they gave him here a job. He's a great guy. We love to work with him because we work very closely with him. We have a Christian Arab. We have all of Israel represented in the staff. And these are all the things that I have been working with all these years. I've seen how the Ethiopians came. I was there when in the 19th, the, 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 the Russian Jews came, you know, and finally they were released and we would give them uh, welcome packages in the great synagogue in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a tremendous privilege for me to the last years of my work life, at least, that I can give uh, of all what, what God has given me and pass it on. All the work that we try to do here, we could never do it without the Danes, without other people that fill our hands. Because, you know, it's, of course, it all costs money, even though we have volunteers here, but they need a place to live. They are people that have given up their, uh, we have a physiotherapist, she was even a physiotherapist in the Olympics. She's an amazing person, had such a career. She felt called to come. She gets a place to live, very little money, and but all of that needs to be paid and all the other volunteers. We have, now uh, we got just five new um, residents, all from the Ukraine. We have been working together with this, our partner organization, to get them out of the Ukraine, out of the most dangerous places like uh, Kharkiv, you know, the eastern side, Kiev. And, and they're living with us now. Hopefully, when all their papers are, uh, are finished, they get a little bit of money from the government. But it will never really, really cover what they, what we give them here. And they came with nothing. So we had to, buy clothing for them, get furniture, you know, all that stuff. Mm. For that we need, in order to help and show that love, we also need money. Mm. And uh, and in that sense, Danes can be, uh, uh, you know, and they can adopt, of course, mm. a survivor. Er du interesseret i at vide mere om Haifa Home og hvordan man kan være med til at støtte, kan du gå ind på icej.dk for mere information. Det sproglige hjørne. Shalom og velkommen til det hebraiske hjørne, hvor vi nu er kommet til det 19. bogstav. Så nu er det snart ved at være slut med bogstaven. Der er jo kun 22, og så går vi videre med nogle ord. Men vi er altså kommet til det 19. bogstav, bogstavet kof eller kuf, som det udtales på moderne hebraisk. Oprindeligt var det et billede af en solopgang eller en solnedgang, og havde noget i retning af en betydning er noget med at samles mørke og lys, samles der i, i solnedgangen. 
Efter sine så blev bogstavet Kof indgraveret på hellige redskaber i templet i Jerusalem, fordi at bogstavet er det første bogstav i ordet for hellig, nemlig kadosh. Så de ting, man brugte i templet, der, der skrev man altså et lille kof på. Kadosh er altså et ord, som man bruger på hebraisk, som hellig. Og hvad er, hvad er egentlig det, altså at noget er helligt? Ja, det handler om, at noget er indvidet, at noget er fuldt indvidet måske, eller at det er sat til side til et særligt brug. Gud er på den måde den, der særligt kaldes hellig i Bibelen. I Isaiah 57, vers 15 står der, Dette siger den højt ophøjet, som troner for evigt, hvis navn er hellig. Jeg bor i det høje og hellige, hos den, der er knust, hvis ånd er nedbøjet, for at opleve den nedbøjet ånd og opleve det knuste hjerte. Selve bogstavet har ligesom en, en streg, der går ned under linjen. Og i rabbins tankegang, eller messians tankegang, der udtrykker det det her med, at Guds i sin hellighed rækker ned til alle dem, som er faldet, dem som lider nød, for at gribe dem og hive dem op. Så Gud er ikke bare alene op i himlen i sin hellighed, men han, han bøjer sig ned, som Isaiah skriver det her i kapitel 57. Så er bogstavet også kendt fra et ord, kalal, som vi kender fra 1. Mosebog, kapitel 12, vers 3, hvor Herren siger til Abraham, Jeg vil velsigne dem, der velsigner dig, og den, der forbander dig, vil jeg forbande. Ordet forbander er her ordet kalal, som egentlig betyder at forbande, men også at tage let på. Det vil sige, at nogle gange er det at tage let på noget, det er det samme som at forbande. Det at ignorere noget eller nogen, det er det samme som forbande. Og Gud siger her, at øh, hvis nogen tager let på Abraham eller Israel, så vil han også forbande dem. Gud vil sige dig og shalom. Du har lyttet til en podcast fra ICEJ Danmark. Ønsker du at vide mere om organisationen, kan du gå ind på icej.dk. Her er der også mulighed for at støtte organisationens arbejde og denne podcast.